ethics of affordable housing amid COVID-19. I'm a professor of philosophy at St. Anselm College and also the exec executive director of the college's Center for Ethics in Business and Governance. Uh, for those of you who are new to the center, the center has for its mission to address important ethical issues in our organizations and communities and to do so through research, education, dialogue, and collaboration. Again, the topic for today's program is the ethics of affordable housing amid COVID-19. As some of our listeners may know, the center's ongoing Housing We Need initiative has been deeply engaged with the affordable housing crisis for some time now. That there is a housing crisis, uh, that it has a uh, deeply ethical dimension, and that this crisis is shifting in the COVID-19 landscape are all topics that we would like to explore a bit in today's discussion. Fortunately, we are joined in today's discussion by some experts on these matters, experts from our very own St. Anselm community. Joining me today are Paul Casey, a graduate of the St. Anselm class of 1970. Paul is a retired partner of the national law firm Ballard Spar. Uh, during his career at Ballard Spar in Washington, DC, Paul represented more than 50 housing authorities across the country in the financing and development of affordable, multifamily and single family housing. He has also recently served as a leader of the Columbia Downtown Housing Corporation, a nonprofit charged with ensuring the development of affordable housing in Columbia, Maryland. Under Paul's leadership, the CDHC has played a vital role in the development and approval of a plan to provide over 900 affordable housing units in downtown Columbia. So we're happy to have Paul with us. We also welcome my colleague, Dr. Tana starbuck Cisco. Tana is a professor of sociology and the chair of the Department of Sociology and Social Work at St. Anselm College. Published in numerous journals, Tana's research interests include gender and politics, media studies of social problems, and how the rhetoric of ambivalence influences public policy concerning homeless women. Her prior research also includes the Homeless Access Survey 2010 a five-year community-based study on the needs of New Hampshire's adult homeless populations, a study that was supported by the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services and the Bureau of Housing and Homelessness. Her work on this project was recognized by the American Sociological Association. Last but not least, we are very pleased to have with us Dean Kristen, a graduate of the St. Anselm College class of 1978 and the current vice chair of the St. Anselm Advisory Board to the Center for Ethics. Dean is Executive Director of New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority, a position he has held since July 2007. He is also a much sought after resource in the policy community, serving as a member of the State of New Hampshire's Council of Partner Agencies, the Council on Resources and Development, the Community Development Advisory Committee, and the Interagency Council on Homelessness. He also currently serves on the Board of Directors of the National Council of State Housing Agencies. Thank you, Paul, Tana, and Dean for joining us today. I can't help but uh, marvel at the concentration of expertise on housing and homelessness that we have in our very own extended St. Anselm community. Perhaps this is fitting since the Benedictine monastic tradition of the college cares very much about rootedness, stability, and, cumulit and commun community, all of which are, I think, uh, benefits we derive from having an affordable home. So in a moment, we'll get the discussion started, but before doing so, uh, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, first, I'm required by state law to inform everyone that this program is recorded. Uh, second, the format of today's episode is as follows. In the first half of today's program, roughly 20 or 25 minutes, our panelists will discuss the topic for today. In the last 20 or 25 minutes or so, those of you in the, the audience will have an opportunity to offer some comments and questions. You'll do this using the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screens. Please type your question or comment and submit it, and I will read it to the panelists. Given our time limits, we may not get all the questions and comments in, so I apologize in advance. I will do the best that I can. With that, I would like to now open the discussion. Uh, let's start with the basics. We are discussing the ethics of affordable housing amid COVID-19. Dean, I'd like to start with you. What exactly are we talking about when we use this expression, affordable housing? When most people hear affordable housing, they think of perhaps subsidized housing or what uh, might be commonly referred to as section eight housing. Is that accurate? What do we mean by affordable housing? 
so thank you, Max. Thank you for doing this um, and for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, you know, the term affordable housing means uh, what a, a lot of different things to a lot of different people. There is a there is a standard that I think has been accepted nationally that that individuals or households should not pay more than thirty percent of their income uh, towards their housing. So whether that is their individuals who are renters or homeowners, um, they should not be expected to expend more than 30% of their income towards housing in order for it to be affordable to them. And that, that structure is used in a lot of public programs uh, that target individuals who are people with disabilities or, or seniors or, or very low income individuals to, to figure out exactly how rent should be structured or how cost should be structured in a particular program. But it's a good standard as well to look at whether uh, a housing market is delivering housing that meets the broader needs of a community. And in our case, in New Hampshire, we really have what I think by almost any assessment is a very expensive housing market and not a particularly affordable one in that context. So for instance, um, we, can, we can look at the at, at renter households in our state and we know that, that almost 45% of, of all of our renter households pay more than 30% of their income towards housing. So by that nationally accepted definition, um, our rental housing market is clearly not affordable to a significant number of people. And in fact, over 20% of those renters are paying more than 50% of their income towards their housing. And that, that's obviously a really significant burden on those households. Uh, the, the homeownership market is a little more affordable, and that tends to be because people who are homeowners tend to have higher incomes to begin with. But um, even there, over 25 or so percent of the people that, that are homeowners are paying more than 30 percent of their income for their housing. So um, affordable housing means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I like to think of it and really the context of um, housing is affordable to you um, if, in fact, it, it does not create a burden to you in terms of your ability to meet your other household needs. And it's affordable if you can find a, a housing that meets your broader sort of uh, household needs without spending an excessive amount of your income. Great, thanks Dean. So, so we clearly have a problem here in New Hampshire. I'm wondering if this is atypical or is this uh, something that other parts of the nation are experiencing? Paul, you've done a lot of work nationwide on uh, affordable housing. What would you say to that? Is New Hampshire a bit of a, an outlier here or are we typical in this, this housing shortage? Well, uh, unfortunately, New Hampshire is more typical than than an outlier, uh, uh, and and I agree with with the the standard that Dean has used as a metric. In fact, that thirty percent standard actually goes back to about nineteen eighty one. The standard began originally with public housing laws in the thirties at roughly twenty percent, and then moved to twenty five percent. But it's been thirty percent for a long time, and when you extrapolate from New Hampshire to the whole country, the numbers are incredible. I mean, we, we have roughly 43 million renters in this country. And of the 43 million renters, um, there are about a quarter of them that are burdened. Uh, if you look at the very low income category, uh, which are people who are at 30% of area median income or below, um, there are roughly 11 million families in that category. Uh, and of that number, more than 7 million are heavily burdened in terms of paying for their rental housing. Uh, and so there is no doubt that there is a very, very serious problem. Um, there are a lot of you know, issues that get generated because of that. I mean, as, as Dean implied in his comment, you know, when you're spending more than 50% of your income for housing, there's mon less money left over for food, less money left over for education, less, less money for public health. Studies have been done showing how families in those situations are much more disadvantaged in terms of their ability to live you know, what would be in most cases uh, a fair, decent standard of living. Um, so the housing burden is significant across the country, not just in New Hampshire. Uh, in fact, in some states it may be worse. Here in Howard County, we have a, uh, Howard County is actually where I live. Um, we are the third wealthiest county in the country by area median income. Uh, and we have an acknowledged gap of over 6,000 affordable units. Uh, and we have a problem just bringing in teachers, policemen, and firemen to live in our community because they can't afford to live here because the cost of living uh, is so high. So it affects people at the low end, people at the middle income range, 
uh, as Dean said, it's various things to various people, but it is a national problem, that's for sure. Yeah, thank you, Paul. So it, it, it stresses uh, families and individuals of, of all different walks of life. I, I would imagine that one of the most extreme manifestations of a housing crisis or a housing shortage would be the homeless. And uh, Ton, I want to turn to you here and just ask you a little bit about uh, homelessness. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and, and how it's related to uh, the problem of uh, affordable housing. What exactly does it mean to be homeless? Who are these people? Um, and just tell us a little bit about that and, and so we can get a sense of um, uh, one of these sort of visible effects of, of the affordable housing shortage. Well, as um, housing affordability and homelessness are intimately uh, connected. As Paul and Dean alluded to, uh, we currently have a severe affordable housing crisis, uh, both within the state and across the country. And then, so not surprisingly, those who are on the lower income, this housing crisis is going to impact them even more significantly and more deeply. Um, today, about 8 million extremely low income households pay at least half their income towards housing. That puts them, as Paul suggested, in risk of other types of housing instability and then puts them at risk for homelessness. When we look at this sort of category of who are homeless, um, we can see that at the national level, single adults make up the largest group that are homeless. Um, it also includes individuals who are veterans, individuals who are vulnerable to physical health issues or mental health issues. But what sometimes people don't realize is the number of children and families who are homeless. Here in the state, for example, over 40% of families with children are part of that sort of homeless group. So homeless individuals, 40% of those. Uh, and also from 2019 information, over 4,000 students here in New Hampshire are considered to be homeless. But what exactly does it mean by homeless? Well, that could be individuals who are able to keep track of in terms of sheltered, so they're visiting sheltered, or individuals who are unsheltered. But it could also be people who are living from family member household to family member household, couch surf uh, surfing, um, just really have an instability in, uh, in housing. Uh, and that housing affordability is, is very key uh, to fixing that, to helping alleviate the problems uh, that come from homelessness too. Great, thank, thank you, Tana. Uh, just to add a quick comment, Max. Please, I mean, yeah. Tana, is out, Tana has identified a very serious problem. Uh, just a recent study uh, a short time ago in the District of Columbia pointed out that there were 5,000 homeless children in the DC schools, uh, even more than were in, in, in New Hampshire. And our own county has 500 homeless children. But the consequence of that is obviously it impacts the ability to study, the ability to achieve educationally, the ability to graduate. Um, it adds stress, anxiety, depression. Um, so it, the consequence of homeless, and, and, and I think we may get to this, but the consequence of what we're impacting being, being felt by, by COVID-19 is that this problem is likely to get more serious, um, which is why it's important to have this discussion today. Right. So Max, a couple of quick comments, if I may, sure. as well. One, one is there, there is, a, I think, a mythology that that um, most homeless people are people that um, have some type of behavioral health or substance use issue. And, and obviously that is prevalent um, amongst people who are homeless. But in, in environments like ours, where there is a very, very um, um, high sort of imbalance between cost of housing and availability of housing and people's incomes, there's also a lot of people that are simply economically homeless. They just can't afford a place to live or they can't find a place that they can afford is probably a better way to put it. And, and that, in, that is very much representative of the families that you, you heard Tana speaking about and, and others that there is this, this uh, misperception many times about who makes up the homeless population. And they may not be the people, frankly, that you see um, living literally on the street, but they may well be living in a car um, or um, as, as mm -hmm. she pointed out, couch surfing as a way of sort of getting through this situation. And the other point I'd make that Paul alluded to a little is that it not only has impacts on those individuals, but I think ultimately it has really significant implications for our communities mm -hmm. because of the demands um, on our communities for services and the implications for the long term in terms of how um, individuals, particularly children who grow up in this kind of situation are going to succeed and the kinds of, of impacts that they're going to have, that they're gonna have on them and on 
the people around them as they, they grow older are really significant. Absolutely. Great. So, so we've made it quite clear, I think, that there is a, a serious problem, uh, a serious problem being experienced here in New Hampshire, but also nationwide of a shortage of, of housing, a shortage of affordable housing. Um, I guess the next question will be, well, what, are, what are some of the causes of this? And I'm sure that discussion could go on at some length, but, um, you know, it, it, from one perspective, it's a little bit puzzling. If there's such a strong demand for housing, one would think that in a market economy, that there would be a response of an increasing supply because there's a need and a demand for it. Um, but apparently that's not happening. And I'm wondering, what are, what are the barriers to more housing being built? To, to satisfy this, um, this shortage and to bring down the cost of housing. Um, so I'll, I'll throw that out to any, any one of you. What do you think are the, the number so, one? So two, Max, I'm maybe maybe just, if I may, I'll just quickly start there. So, so yeah. you pointed out well that this is a supply and demand dynamic. One of the reasons right. why costs are so high and there's all these other challenges is because there's a lot of demand and there just isn't enough supply. And you're right, logically what we learned in school was that the market is supposed to react to that and produce more of whatever it is people want uh, that there, there's a shortage of. Um, and to a degree that's true, but most of the housing that we, we have in our country is obviously produced by the private sector using private resources. Um, that all said, there are significant public sector policies that impact the ability of the private sector to create this particular product. Um, bottom line is we regulate very heavily how housing is, is built, where it can be built, how much of it, what kind effectively. Um, and that is done in most places and certainly here in New Hampshire, especially um, very much at a very local level um, as based on local policy decisions. Uh, and it has had a huge impact, at least in our environment, on the amount of housing that has been built and the type of housing that has been built to respond to this demand. Uh, and and I, I would add, Dean is right. I, I, I would say that there are, in my mind, three factors interrelated here. Um, the first one, as Dean said, is the, is the issue of zoning and local control, which actually allows issues like nimbyism to manifest itself, people who don't want to have affordable housing nearby, because their vision of affordable housing may not be what we've been talking about. And so they may not be thinking about uh, families like they are. Um, and may have a vision of some kind of high rise public housing project. Uh, but the, the, the second issue is just the economy. I mean, what, what's startling is the National Low Income Housing Coalition has reported that there is nowhere in this entire nation where a person earning the minimum wage can rent a two bedroom apartment and not be heavily burdened in terms of their, in terms of their income. It just, I mean, the, the, the problem is, e is economic in part. Um, it's it, because of the lack of, 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 of adequate um, uh, income. And then the third reason I think is affecting the supply and demand is not just how we use our land in zoning, but the amount of land. I, mean, I, I think it was President Eisenhower who years and years ago when his president said he wanted to invest in land because it was the one commodity of which there was nothing more being made. So it was limited um, and, and, but, here in Howard County, as an example, we struggle with the fact that we have this 6,000 unit gap in affordable housing and 85% of the county's land is developed already. I mean, even trying to address the problem, we either have to go to higher density or one of the issues we're confronting is can we have a local law which says that when the government releases surplus property, the first consideration has to be for affordable housing. But that's the other issue, is with a limited amount of land, there, it becomes more difficult and people want, to, people want to preserve their neighborhoods. That's where the zoning comes in. And, and I think too, I mean, it's, it's another factor, but so much of what we do in terms of our housing decisions is impacted by our schools. People envision schools in a particular neighborhood being, being having a certain, uh, I would say composition in terms of economic, and, economic composition and diversity. And so, it, part of what we have to do is also expand our ability to look at ter look at school systems and, and 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 neighborhoods in a broader, more economically and more um, uh, uh, diverse way. Max, Max, I agree. I agree with everything that Paul said, but I would also point out that I think that there's issues not just with people opposing what we would just define as affordable housing, 
but, but frankly, almost any kind of housing development um, mm -hmm. creates some type of pushback um, in, in many parts of our country and in many parts of our state. And, and so um, you have this supply demand imbalance, you're just not adding enough housing generally. And like any other commodity, if you were to add, even if you were to add more housing at the higher end, it would begin to mitigate some of the shortage and some of the cost pressures at the, the sort of moderate end and potentially even eventually the lower end. And even that is not easy to do in most of our communities. Yeah. So, okay. So let Paul, back to your comment. So you mentioned three things and I think Dean, you, you seem to reinforce them. Three, three reasons why there's a shortage of housing. One is uh, the, um, the shortage of land availability for, for building and development of new homes. Uh, low wages, uh, the inability for people to afford uh, uh, homes. And, and, and then the, the first one you had mentioned was uh, zoning and local control, which was too restrictive. And Dean, I think you had started with that. But you had also mentioned in there nimbyism and maybe what you refer to as sort of myths and misperceptions about the kinds of people who would reside in these more affordable homes. I want to just spend a moment on that. What are some of these myths and misperceptions about there about people who, who might, might live in affordable homes in our community. Um, because it seems to me if, that's, if there's nimbyism and fears out there, they surround uh, that kind of question. So anybody can perhaps answer that. What are, what are people thinking? Why are they afraid to have uh, affordable housing in their community? And how is that maybe um, in error? I uh, just quickly, Max, I'll, I'll start out, you know, clearly there is a perception that when we talk about affordable housing, and indeed when we talk about any kind of lower cost housing, um, that we are, are talking about folks that are, are perhaps not employed, people that um, are not going to contribute to their communities in any positive context. And, and there's, there's really no basis for that assumption. The vast majority of, of individuals who reside, even in housing that has some type of public subsidy to help create it, um, are, are, are working. They have jobs. They have an obligation to pay rent. Um, certainly, there are populations, um, people with significant disabilities, uh, in some cases of seniors on, on uh, fixed incomes, that are not likely to have jobs and are not likely to be working. But the vast majority of people that, that live in the type of housing that, for instance, New Hampshire housing would be part of financing, the kinds of things that I'm sure that that Paul was part of creating um, are people that work in the community. They provide, they, they work in service jobs, they work in entry level jobs. In many cases, they, they are in fact, um, as he pointed out earlier, um, public servants. They are the first responders and teachers and people that, that are really make a community work uh, in a fundamental sense. Um, that, however, that perception exists that when we're talking about this, we're talking about massive high rises that are going to create all sorts of, of community and social issues um, and, um, and have other problems for neighborhoods. And, and I think one thing to add to what Dean said is, and something that the, the New Hampshire Institute, the, the, the ethics, uh, uh, the, 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 your, the ethics group is doing there at the university at, at St. Anselm uh, is education. I mean, that you've made a broad commitment to educating the public. And, and exactly as Dean said, if the public understood better what's involved, it, I think, would be a higher level of acceptance. And two small stories from Howard County. One, when we were trying to expand the number of affordable units in our mixed income setting, there was some public opposition. And the head of our housing commission took the residents to a mixed income community and they were stunned at what it was. I mean, they, they, their perception was changed dramatically because they saw what this was. It was really housing of choice. Um, the other thing is we, we helped to explain, um, we, we used as an example, one of the members of our county council's daughter uh, was a librarian in our library. And the daughter couldn't afford to rent a, house, rent a unit in Columbia uh, and was living at home. Uh, and so the, the point was, it, it's you. You need to you need to educate and help people understand. And also, I think the other point that Dean was making was that everybody benefits. I mean, the community benefits when you do this because we are we have a healthier community. We have less homelessness, as Tana was pointing out. So there are, there's less stress on our uh, on our resources. Um, overall, I think that if we are able to educate and help people understand the benefit of affordable housing, we would have a greater likelihood of getting it approved. Great. So I'd like to. Uh, turn our attention a little bit now to the current crisis, the COVID-19 
um, uh, uh, viral outbreak and how it's impacted this problem, the shortage of affordable housing. And let's start with the homeless population, the most vulnerable uh, people affected by the shortage of affordable housing. So how, how do you see this COVID-19 impacting the homeless population, uh, Tana? What, what, um, what are some particular dangers that are, that are here or challenges that we need to face? One of my uh, favorite quotes that I've seen particularly put out there connected to COVID-19 and homelessness is this one right here. Um, the ability to self-quarantine, social isolation, and stay-at-home orders are difficult, if not impossible, to follow when you do not have a home. It's just not, it cannot happen. Um, so subsequently, we have seen both at the local level at, and at the federal level, a, a lot of changes put in place and funding put in place to help our most vulnerable uh, here. Uh, if you're uh, from the Manchester area, you've seen lots of work connected to um, putting out things like toilets and sinks and trash pickup, um, changes in different uh, quarantines or new shelters such as St. Casimir that's been open to help for sort of COVID-19 quarantine. Um, and really a, a change in the way that the shelters work, uh, having to reduce capacity, um, but to offer as many services as they can. We've also seen uh, the CARES Act, where uh, over $4 billion have been given to emergency shelter grants, um, where we've seen the, uh, the extenuation of eviction notices. So subsequently, you can't evict anybody for 120 days right now, although that's set to expire soon. Two and a half million for fair housing uh, and another 300 million in housing grants. So the federal government is stepping up and helping. Um, that being said, we know that this population is extremely vulnerable to health issues. Um, older individuals who are homeless, um, if they are not able to, because of uh, self-quarantining, not able to um, get the resources that they need, uh, research has shown that individuals who are homeless um, are more likely to be hospitalized, um, more likely to need critical care, and two to three times more likely to die. So subsequently, not only does it put a strain on uh, having homelessness, uh, just a general strain on community resources, but connected to COVID, it puts another strain on health resources that we have. Great, thanks, Tana. Uh, Dean, um, more broadly, how has COVID-19 impacted the landscape of housing and affordable housing in New Hampshire? Well, I think Tana's point about homelessness is a really important one, and I'll just add one quick thing. You know, shelter providers, um, do extraordinarily important work. They use their, uh, well, the, the term that I like to, to use is that they use their real estate really efficiently um, in the sense that historically they have had to really um, place a lot of people into a small amount of space in order to meet those needs. They can't do that in this environment. And so I think one of the points that she was making is that we need to fundamentally rethink how we house the homeless going forward. And part of that means we need to provide different structures for those kind of emergency shelters, but we're also gonna to need to think more about how we can help those individuals move into different kinds of housing um, that, that is more permanent for them uh, going forward and, and out of shelters, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, I think the, the concerns that people have about the housing environment in, in this situation are, uh, first go to the fact that there's been an enormous uptick, as we all know, in unemployment across the country and, in, and, and really in, in a certain concentrated areas. And um, most of the jobs that were impacted by this, frankly, are, are likely to be jobs that um, are, were held by renters. If you look at the dynamic of the sort of demographics of, of who rents and you look at the kinds of jobs that were most heavily impacted, service jobs, retail jobs, uh, those kind of hospitality industry jobs, they're more likely to be renters than homeowners. And so they're more, those individuals were more likely to be impacted with unemployment. Um, right now, there seems to be some mitigation of the risk of them losing their housing because they can't pay their rent by the combination of the eviction moratorium that, that was mentioned and the fact that the federal government stepped up with a very substantial additional uh, amount of, of temporary um, unemployment insurance. That also expires soon at the end of July. So there's a concern uh, across the country about what the implications are going to be when that extra money goes away and those moratoria begin to expire, are we gonna see a huge uptick in 
evictions. And there have been some resources that have been made available in New Hampshire and in other places to begin looking at some type of emergency rental assistance programs, whether those are going to be adequate to bridge us from um, this current situation to when those individuals become reemployed um, remains unknown. And so there's a particularly significant concern there. Um, for homeowners, many of those individuals also were impacted in terms of loss of income and maybe employment. And again, the federal government and the CARES Act put um, um, in place the opportunity for people who have federally supported mortgages, which in New Hampshire amounts to about 70% of all homeowners who have mortgages, um, have a federally assisted mortgage, which is a pretty substantial number if you think about it for a moment. Um, they, can, they can ask for mortgage forbearance uh, for a six month period and perhaps an extension. But at some point, forbearance, it's important to keep in mind as a meaning. It's, it's one, of those, one of those buzzwords that we tend to use and, and people sometimes are confused by. It means deferral. Uh, it doesn't mean forgiveness. And so at some point, those payments are going to have to be made. And there will be some challenges that individuals face. There could be an uptick in foreclosures. Um, we know that that has a lot of negative implications, not only for individuals who may lose their housing, but also for communities, for neighborhoods um, that may, may suffer, frankly, from the implications of significant numbers of foreclosures. We lived through that not that long ago as a state and as a, as a nation, and I don't think anybody wants to see that happen again. So paying some attention to how we're going to make sure that doesn't happen is a really critical thing as well. And, and, oh, Max, I was just going to ask you, Paul, if you're seeing similar things in the Maryland area. Uh, we are, uh, but I wanted, I, I wanted to um, uh, underscore something that Dean said and put kind of a national number on it. Um, the, the, I, I think that the COVID legislation has been a really important safeguard in preventing evictions. Uh, ordinarily, in any given year, there's an average of about 300,000 eviction, 300, evictions across the country in any month. So somewhere between three and four million evictions a year. Um, that number is stopped because of the COVID legislation. Um, a recent study done by the Urban Land Institute published just, just a week, just last month, indicated that la in April, roughly 19% of all renters uh, had some problem paying their rent, roughly. Um, that number is expected to increase uh, in May and June. Now, the interesting thing is that the problem will be exacerbated when the unemployment benefits go away. And so it will be a very serious problem. Speaking of my own experience here in Maryland, uh, the Housing Commission just had a meeting uh, earlier this week and it was reported that, un that unexpectedly, our rents were almost on budget. Um, and we, we rent roughly 3,000 units. And the reason was because of the unemployment subsidy. Um, and our ability to work with people. But there's a concern about what happens. And so, and just as, I, I don't know if New Hampshire has done this, but a number of counties in Maryland, including Baltimore County and Howard County, where I live, have adopted extended moratoriums on evictions. So that in, in Howard County, eviction moratoriums will continue for three months after the, the declaration of the national emergency um, and the statewide emergency. So that's another, that's a stopgap. So, it is a serious problem in Maryland. It's a serious problem across the country. I mean, one thing that we can think about if we want to be advocates um, is that the new HEROES Act passed by the House, which is now sitting in the Senate, provides $100 billion in rental relief uh, for, for, for housing. Um, and I, I don't know what Dean and Tana would say, but to me, the simplest, most effective way to prevent a housing crisis is to provide additional subsidy. Because if you don't, as Dean said, mortgages don't get paid, um, you know, lenders who have lent on, on properties don't get their monies paid, um, and there's a ripple effect. In fact, one thing we have done in the Housing Commission, we approved at this last meeting, holding back some of our reserves that were supposed to go to pay deferred developers fee in anticipation that they may be needed because we've had to, we've had to reduce maintenance because of the issues that we were facing. So anyway, I, I think that we should think about proactive measures we can adopt and promote in order to avoid a crisis come later this year. If, if I may, Max, I, I would agree with, with everything Paul said. I think what's really critical here is to think about this in terms of the implications 
that um, a lot of evictions or a lot of foreclosures have, not just for the individuals in question, but for a lot of other elements of our communities and, and our institutions. So a, a property owner that um, is, is, is um, not able to pay their mortgage might be at risk of losing their home. That has an impact on whomever lent them that money. It has an impact on the community because taxes are probably not gonna be paid. It has an impact on the neighborhood. If you have renters who aren't paying, then, then property owners, and most of the rental housing in our state is owned by what are essentially very small businesses, people that own less than 10 housing units. So they're not getting their money, they're not paying their mortgages, they're not paying taxes. That has implications for our communities. And so the, the intervention he's talking about, which is to address the core need and to actually provide some support for individuals as they transition back into the workforce is a much more effective way of doing that than trying to pick up the pieces later on. And frankly, it's probably a better way than continuing to extend eviction moratoria indefinitely, because that has a lot of negative implications for the market as well. It's better to just help the people that really are in need um, rather than uh, kind of try to artificially stop the process from moving forward. I'd agree. Great. Thank you. So, okay, I've been chomping at the bit to get to this next question, which is the ethics of it all, um, which is kind of my bailiwick. But I, you know, to me, uh, the center uh, made a good choice in choosing this issue of affordable housing as an issue that we'd like to focus our attention on, not just because it's an urgent problem and one that concerns our local communities and people of all walks of life and businesses, but because it's a fundamental ethical issue at work here. But getting our heads around what the ethics of it are is not as simple as it might look. So I want to throw you guys a direct question. Do you think that people have a right to an affordable home? And maybe Tana, we'll start with you because you see the most um, extreme examples of this. People who are living under bridges or couch surfing. What, what do you think they, they have a right to in terms of uh, housing? And then my next question will be, what are our responsibilities to these community members who don't have a home? What do you think, Tom? I think it's um, the beauty of working at a place like St. Anselm College where we can draw on our Catholic and Benedictine heritage is really about the idea of community and taking care of those who are in essence, um, really the most vulnerable in population, uh, in our population. And thus just from that basic groundwork, I think ethically it is important that everybody has a home, um, that everyone is housed. Uh, in some way, shape, or form, because housing uh, is so foundational to taking care of the individual and the family in other contexts as well, um, whether it's from educational resources to health resources to job stability, that starts in the home. You can't do those other things well or easily if you don't have a home that you can return to if you don't have shelter. Um, so from a Catholic and Benedictine standpoint, I think ethically, um, it's something that we have to do. Hmm. Good. Paul or Dean, what do you think about this? Well, I, I, would, I would jump in and, and, and echo what Tana said from a Benedictine perspective. I mean, the Benedictine philosophy has always been a welcoming philosophy. Welcome when you come to the Benedictine monastic community. Uh, you're expected at some point to start working for, your, for being there, but you're always welcomed. You can't welcome someone into a home if you don't have one. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, I thought about when you ask this question, what does it mean to raise affordable housing to a right? And you know, as our country has progressed, we've moved a long way on that journey toward what is rights. And I think that arc of progress may be reflected by our Catholic and Benedictine tradition, but it's based upon that statement in the Declaration of Independence, you know, that there are, we're all endowed with, with certain unalienable rights and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and how can you pursue happiness if you're couch surfing, if you're homeless, if you're struggling to make ends meet? And we have, you know, no one would argue, I think, with the fact that we every that, that slavery is wrong, segregation is wrong, but there are other things that we've had to move toward, including things like the right to privacy, which came in in nineteen in the nineteen sixties as a result of a Supreme Court case, or health care as a right. The discussion began then in the 60s with Medicare, um, more recently with the, and living wage is a right. People should have a living wage by which they could afford a rental unit. I think we should elevate affordable housing to that same category. And it's only if we think of it as a right that we begin to 
advocate for it on that basis, knowing that if it's not there, there are so many adverse consequences. And I think consistent with our Catholic Christian Benedictine philosophy, that we can work toward it being a right. It may take decades, but if we hold that as a goal, we're more likely to achieve it. Uh, so I'd like to think of that arc of progress moving in that direction. Great. Dean, any comments? Well, well, I agree with what, what has been said. I guess I would uh, add to that that, that you know, we've, we've talked about the, the impact on individuals and, and the need to, um, to support um, their, their opportunity to grow and to, to, to live. And I think Paul talked about their right to, to happiness. But there's also the fundamental question about the implications of not having adequate shelter for individuals um, on our communities. Um, in terms of the economic and the social implications of that for those communities and, and, and how it affects uh, the broader uh, sort of society. Um, and so I think we need to think about that both in, in, as, as individuals and as members of those communities that really do we not have an obligation to try to make sure that we all um, are in a better place than we would be if we just tolerated um, having people who are homeless and tolerated people who have significant amounts of housing insecurity. Great. Uh, uh, let me just make a comment myself, too. I, I've, I've changed my thinking about this a bit. Um, to explain that, I'll say that in ethics, they often refer to things that are called negative rights versus positive rights. And negative rights are usually um, the rights of non-interference, like the right to life is actually a right uh, of a person to not have their life interfered with by other people. So it's really a right to not have anybody do anything that's harmful to you. Um, the right to, f to, to uh, freedom of association or speech. Similarly, people not interfering with your expression of yourself. A positive right is a right to have somebody do something for you. Um, say the right to health care would be something like that. Um, I usually, I used to think of, of the right to uh, affordable home as a positive right. That is to say that, you know, it may be a right that people have for us to do something for them and providing them with an affordable shelter. But I've actually come to think of it as possibly a negative right. And I'll just leave you with this because I think that there has been a lot of barriers and obstacles that communities uh, have put up, uh, policy, ordinances, nimbyism, that actually interferes with people's ability to develop new homes, but also to, to, to live and purchase these homes or, or to rent them. So I think, um, I think that it's maybe both of those, that, that the right to a home might be a, a positive right, but also it might be a right to have people stop interfering with the ability for other people to develop new affordable homes for people to live in. I don't know, what do you, what do you think about so, it? So, so Max, yeah. I would love to respond to that very quickly to say that I, I agree, I think, with the core premise that you're putting forward, which is that that I'll, I guess, I, as I was trying to say earlier, a, a great deal of the dynamic that we're, we're faced with here is that um, the, the market cannot respond in, in the way that it theoretically ought to be able to, simply because of the artificial barriers that are, that are put in its way. And I'll, I'll go back to something Paul said earlier. I really have very little knowledge of, of the community in which he lives. But I will say to you, I've heard many, many times people say to me, well, there isn't any land to develop. Well, the decisions about how we use land are made through regulatory processes. And we decide what kind of density we will allow and what kinds of housing we will allow and, and, and you know, how literally how close properties can be to each other and things of that nature. And we artificially determine how much land is gonna be available to create housing in that context. Yeah. And it has this, this ripple effect down ultimately, if you really think about it, down to the issue of homelessness, because if there was adequate housing and there was uh, therefore more affordability, many of those individuals would be able to obtain housing that can't now. Um, so I, I would argue your, your view on this as being ensuring that people are not exercising um, their, um, um, if you will, rights and privileges in a way that interfere with others is a very good way to think about it. Yeah, yeah and, and I think Dean, it, ooh, go ahead, oh, Tom. Go ahead, I was, I was actually going to uh, go off of your idea of negative rights, particularly connected to housing and the historical policies that the U.S. has created towards the Black community. Um, things like redlining, restrictive covenants, even sundown towns, which meant that if you were Black and in that town after sunset, you could get arrested, um, that you needed to leave. Now, those types of things, I think, are a really great example of 
uh, these historical policies that leave an impact on communities moving forward and take a long time, not just uh, a few years, but take decades to reverse. Well, and, and I, I want to just to, to piggyback on that, Max, is there a category of an ethical right that is somewhere in the gray area between uh, negative and positive? The, the reason I say that is because I agree with what you said and what Dean said and, and Tana, that there are barriers. There are barriers of to fair housing and there are barriers to um, to land use which which and, and and zoning barriers but but also I do not think that we could solve the problem just by limiting the barriers remember we, we don't have a we do not have an affordable income standard which says that people who have earning a minimum wage can even rent a two-bedroom apartment and what we've just what one of the programs that's actually trying to deal with the issue as, as Dean and Tana may know, is Enhanced Vouchers, which is a program which allows Section 8 vouchers to be enhanced with other subsidies to be actually put into areas that exceed the fair market rent. And we are trying to do some of that here in Howard County with, with 50 vouchers, um, because people who are able to live in the economically more advantageous communities can thrive and do better, but that wouldn't happen without additional subsidy. So mm -hmm. I think we can, we need to deal with the barriers, uh, but we also need to be able to say that we want to reallocate our resources to assist people who are in need. That's a fascinating question. And you may be right. It may be somewhere in between, uh, Paul. Uh, but Ton, I just want to reinforce your point. I think the question you raise about that, that set of barriers, which we could call uh, racist barriers um, that have historically um, uh, been implemented at an institutional level. Um, we thought that maybe the Fair Housing Act of 1968 may have, you know, helped in a, in a lot of ways and gotten rid of that, but I'm not sure that that's the case. And that would be a discussion of its own. Um, I don't even think we could do justice to that in today's discussion. Um, but the question of, of, of racism and housing and segregation um, is, I think, a fascinating question, one deserving of more attention. But thank you for bringing that up, Tana. Um, so, but I'm going to stop us there and go to questions. We've got a whole list of fascinating questions to share with you uh, people. So let me see if I can get through a few of these. Um, I'm gonna start with Dave Canary. Uh, Dave, I think is bringing up a question, uh, Dean, that piggybacks on something you said. He says, great panel, thank you all. So we've talked about a lack of affordable housing, which is an issue of economic pressure on people who can afford housing and homelessness, which is an issue of survival. From an ethical standpoint and thinking about justice and human rights, is homelessness the more important issue or are affordability and homelessness so interrelated that we should approach them as manifestations of the same issue? Uh, Dean, do you want to answer that or Tana? Uh, wow, that's a really complex question. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll start very quickly. Let me just say that, that I think, as I said earlier, Part of the homelessness problem is very much related to affordability. And if you had a more adequate and balanced supply of housing, there would be more opportunity for particularly lower income people to obtain housing that was stable for them and there would therefore be less homelessness. Um, there are much bigger issues that contribute to homelessness that go beyond that that I'm not as qualified to speak to as, 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 as others might be. Um, and they would still be with us presumably even if we had a more balanced housing supply and they would need to be addressed and we need to make investments to address those issues. Okay, good. Tana, any comment? Uh, I would say housing is the number one. Housing is the major solution to homelessness. Yes, we would still have to ramp up social services in areas particularly connected to mental health needs. Um, but if you work on affordable housing, a lot of your issues in homelessness goes away. Great. Okay, we have some other questions here that um, kind of ask about what we can do going forward. Um, let me see if I can get it to a few of these. One from DJ Nelson says, how do people elevate advocacy on this issue? Some of the barriers discussed are local barriers as well as state and national barriers. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, maybe each of you could think of maybe one thing that we can do at the local, state or national level that might uh, address this problem. Well, uh, let, let me jump in then, Max, and just illustrate with one thing we've done here in Howard County. Um, we've created what's called a housing affordability coalition, uh, which is a citizens group um, of more than 50 uh, individuals and organizations advocating on affordable housing issues. Uh, what we've done is we've, let, we've raised the profile of those issues. Um, as an example, 
There was a budget issue of whether or not we would end up supporting or the, whether the county would have a housing affordability master plan of process. Um, and we supported it, we, we, we were successful, it's now in the budget and that process is going forward to see how we will develop affordable housing, including the land issues that Dean raised. I mean, uh, 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 it, it seems to me that there are things like that that can be done to generate citizen interest uh, and to have, and, and we did have success. I mean, what, one other small thing that was done um, was a, a new project in downtown Columbia, which was actually under threat of being torn, not going forward because of the COVID crisis. Um, and we generated more than a thousand emails to the members of the county council uh, in the course of a weekend, which actually saved the project to be funded later. So there are things that can be done, but I, I would say start with a kind of a grassroots effort to get locals interested in the issue and then raise that to, to your local officials so that you can have impact on local legislation. Great. Uh, Dean, any suggestions? Well, yeah, well, I, I would say that as we discussed earlier that particularly in New Hampshire, a, a lot of the issue stems back to uh, regulatory policy and processes. And uh, those are done very locally in New Hampshire. Um, and the public officials that are, that are making those policies, that are implementing them, are doing them um, not, I think, because they, they hate affordable housing. They're doing them because they think of what their policies are, are representative of what they think the people in their communities want. Um, and so they need to hear from the people in those communities about what they really want and, and whether they really do, in fact, understand the connection between a healthy community, a healthy economy, and having um, adequate housing. I think the survey that the center did pointed to the fact that increasingly um, people are recognizing that connection and are supportive of change perhaps in the way that some of those regulatory policies are, are created and implemented. And so that would be my suggestion as to how people can get engaged, understand what's going on in your community and become part of that process. Yeah, I understand on that front, Dean, that um, there were a number of bills in the Concord legislature generated by the governor's housing task force, which you were a member of, um, that um, because of some procedural issues in the legislature, um, in effect died along with some 900 other bills, uh, unfortunately. So um, I guess maybe speaking to our, our um, representatives and telling them that we really support these proposals and bills might help um, these bills uh, survive going forward. But um, yeah, I, I guess a lot of it is procedural and legislative. Tana, can I turn to you? What, what could people do in their communities for the homeless? Is there anything that we can do for those people who are um, in, in, need of, um, in need of a place, a shelter to live in? Well, first and foremost, learn more about um, your local shelters. For example, we have fantastic organizations here in um, Manchester, Families in Transition, New Horizons. Uh, look for those, uh, look at those agencies, be able to donate to those agencies or provide help to those agencies. I would also suggest that individuals, when it particularly comes to homelessness, do some self-education. Um, the ideas that we were talking about today, about NIMBY, about learning about who the homeless are. Um, there's a variety of national organizations and local organizations that you can look to um, that you can read up and find the data and statistics on who are homeless in the United States and ways to help. So part of that has to be a self-education um, in order to adequately ad advocate for those who are most vulnerable. Uh, Max, I'd like to add one thing that I forgot, but I think it's, I, I'll just throw it out there. Anybody who wants to search for it could, but we talked just briefly, we touched on fair housing issues. Uh, and here in Howard County, we've created what is called the Columbia Housing Center, which is a group which has as its core value an integrated community. And it is actually serving as a rental agency to encourage people to rent in areas where there would be diverse populations. It's based on what was done in Oak Park, Illinois, the Oak Park Regional Housing Center, which successfully dealt with that issue in Oak Park. To the best of our knowledge, there are only two like it in the country, Oak Park and now Columbia. But it's worth going to the Columbia Housing Center website to see what they're doing, because Columbia is intended to be an integrated diverse community. That's how it was founded by Jim Rouse in the 60s. And so this is an effort to preserve that and avoid uh, what would be segregation that could develop. So anyway, I, I just suggest that as a thing that could help. Max, if I can just say quickly, a subject for 
further conversation is that the, the really what, what Paul's talking about is there's an enormous amount of evidence that shows that when you provide people who perhaps have, have traditionally lived in low-income communities and in areas of distress with the opportunity to, to live and, and to work in areas that have more economic opportunity, um, they, they has, it has enormous positive impacts on their lives and ultimately on their families and on, on those communities. And it's really something we need to, to focus on and think about more. So on that subject, there's a couple questions, uh, we only have a few more minutes, but um, that relate to the resistance uh, of community members to allowing such housing to be built in their community. So Mike uh, Keis, or Keis says, existing home and landowners may benefit economically from high barriers to entry and may want to preserve artificially high prices. Do we have any suggestions on how to address this conflict between the public and the personal interests? And Norm Turcott, I think, expresses it a little bit differently. He says, does this not go well beyond racial bias? Is it not economic bias? He says, for example, I live in a nice neighborhood, $400,000 homes on two acre lots, et cetera. I don't want janitors, ditch diggers, and dishwashers moving in next door because it's gonna lower the value of my property. Um, is, this, is this a problem of self-interest versus public interest? That there are some communities that may not want to allow more affordable housing to be built because it's going to undermine the value of their homes. How would you address that, that question or problem? Is it just a matter of you've got to be a good person and realize that there are people out there who deserve a home to live in, even if that means that it might under, undermine the value of your property? Or is there some way you can appeal to people's self-interest and say, no, this is, this is good for you and your community? What do you think? Uh, well, I would just say that I think that there's a, there, that the economic uh, benefits of having, for, for, for the broader community, of having that balanced supply and, and having opportunities for a broad range of individuals to live in a broader community, in a region, in a state, are pretty clear. And, and um, the notion that any individual community can sort of wall itself off and not provide any support for that broader need, um, I think is really not realistic. Um, yeah. in the long term. And Dean, I'm going to add to that because that means that they're basically walling it off to their young, the children who want to start families in their community, the people who are going to be working in their restaurants or, or putting out their fires or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the healthcare industry. Um, they're walling it off to their seniors who want to age in place in their communities. Is that really what we want to do is close our community to these people and just, just so we can keep our pricey homes? I, I think it's a good point. It's a very good point, Max. And, and I, I would go back to what, something we said earlier, which was education. I think if, we, if we're able to educate people to the point that Dean said, that people understand the benefit of the community, there's a greater understanding. There are also, there are legal barriers to preventing this kind of thing that, that the courts have upheld. But I think that the other thing that we need to think about is if we are able to use land use, rule, land use in a constructive way, you can provide for affordable housing that's consistent with the overall community. You can provide for accessory housing dwelling units. You can provide for possibly, you know, uh, uh, smaller lot sizes, which still can have attractive, you know, four and five unit buildings. I mean, the, the notion is if, if, going back to what you'd said earlier, if we believe housing is a right, that people shouldn't be homeless because you have what, you know, in, in the midst of COVID, wasn't it Ecuador that ended up in a disaster because there's no housing, people don't have, don't have running water. We, we're not, I mean, there are people in this country that don't have the benefits of housing that are homeless. But if we all recognize its importance, then we'll work to find ways to do that. And, and that's, that's the, I mean, so I think the important thing here is to educate and then to acknowledge it as a right and then to work collaboratively to find ways to do it consistent with the community, which could be a variety of tools that we can, that we can talk about in the next installment on our, on our panel. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of which, Paul, thank you. Yes, we're at 3.31, and I promised to finish by 3.30. Uh, so what I'd like to do is close um, this, uh, this program. I'd like to thank our panelists for their wonderful insights and for a stimulating conversation. Uh, and to all of you in the audience for tuning in and plying them with such interesting questions. And I really apologize. I'm looking at this list of questions that I would love to keep our panelists here and read off and, and do this for another hour, but that would be unfair to them and to all of you. So I apologize to those of you whose questions I did not get to. I do encourage all of you to keep an eye on upcoming programs and events from the center. 
on the topic of affordable housing, uh, on race in the housing industry or racism in the housing industry, uh, urban development questions, and more. Um, thank you all of you again. And from the Center for Ethics at St. Anselm College, I wish all of you a wonderful Father's Day weekend. Goodbye. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.